I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10, look at verse 25 first. And it says, For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger and their destruction. So that phrase, for yet a very little while, that puts you in the context of the second coming. Look at Hebrews 10.37. Hebrews 10.37. It says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. So yet a very little while. Then John 16, 16 through 19. The Lord says, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father... They said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among you of yourselves of that I said a little while? And ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. He said a little while seven times there. The, the phrase a little while was said. Now look at Psalm 37 and verse 10. Psalm 37, 10. It says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, though, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. So that's what this is going to be called is, In a little while. And you can hear that phrase used both ways, and it depends on how you look at the phrase. Back when I was little and I was in a hurry to do something, or I was bored, or we were in the car on a long car ride or something like that, I would say, are, are we about there? And they would say, "Just it's just a little while longer. Or we might have been waiting somewhere, and I was asking how much longer, and they would say, just, just a little while longer. So that's one way you can look at it. Or, you know, maybe you were little, and there was a vacation coming up, but, but it was a good ways off. And you'd say, is it still a long time before we go on vacation? And they might say, well, it's going to be a little while. So you can look at it like that, or you can look at it as... It's just a, just a little while longer. Like it's not that far off. And that's what this is about. In just a little while. Life gets so... Like sometimes you think, you sit around and think, life is so hard. I'm ready for it to be over. I got 35 more years of working. I've got this much time doing this thing that I hate. And you can sit around and think about how much time you have left doing a certain thing and you're just wondering when is this all going to be over? Well, just in a little while. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come in the rapture. Just a little while and the rapture will be over, the tribulation will be over and you'll be coming back with the Lord at the second coming in just a little while. So Isaiah 10 and verse 1. And just a little while, it says, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that write grievousness which they have prescribed. So you got some people that are making unrighteous decrees, and grievousness is what they're prescribing. Kind of like the Pharisees. They bind heavy burdens that are grievous to be born. Yet they won't lay hold on them with one of their fingers. 
you got people making these unrighteous decrees. They don't care about God's laws. They're making up their own laws. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming in just a little while, he's going to set up his kingdom. And instead of prescribing grievous things, it's going to be a prescription for peace. Isaiah says, woe to them. That's great sorrow or great distress to those who decree unrighteous decrees. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. So they are prescribing evil and acting like it's good. Isaiah 5.20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That's exactly what they're doing. They got unrighteous decrees today for sodomy, abortion, pornography, drugs, booze. They call evil good and good evil. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. Look what it says, to turn aside the needy from judgment, in verse 2, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, though that widows may be their prey, that they may rob the fatherless. So they go after the needy, the poor, the widows, the fatherless. So they oppress the poor widows. Around... Uh, my town, there's a motorcycle gang called the Widow Makers. What a, what a horrible thing to call your motorcycle gang, Widow Makers. You know what they're saying is they're going around killing people's husbands. They're making widows. They're making uh, children that don't have a father. They're making widows and fatherless. You know, God's... Uh, Big on taking care of widows and the fatherless. And yet you're going around with widow makers on your jacket. I'd be afraid to get on the motorcycle with that on my jacket. That's just a bunch of uh, overgrown babies. Grown 50 and 60 year old men that have never grew up. And I'd be ashamed to wear that on my jacket. Widow makers. So it says to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. You see, the law should be made from Scripture, not man's wisdom, not man's tradition. In Matthew 15, 6, it says... Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. They make the word of God of none effect by their tradition. It's all about what they think is right and wrong. And men begin to start doing what's right in their own eyes. And when you start doing what's right in your own eyes, you make these unrighteous decrees that aren't about the Word of God, they're about man's wisdom and your tradition, people get away from God's laws. And things go bad. People start being treated unfairly. The needy, the poor, the widows, the fatherless. But under God's laws, under God's commands, nobody is treated any better. And when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, there's going to be a prescription for peace. He's going to bring peace. Just a little while, and you'll be serving a holy dictator on earth who is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. And Jerusalem will be the City of Righteousness, Isaiah 1, 26. And everybody's going to be treated the same. Everybody's going to be treated fairly. It says in Isaiah 10, 3, And what will you do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory? So what are you going to do? Historically, he's saying, you know, what are you going to do when the des desolation comes from far? Here, historically, 
it's going to be the Assyrian invasion. But you think about it prophetically, the day of visitation could be the second coming as well. When God comes down to visit the iniquity of all the sin of this world and flame and fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, where will they flee for help? Where will you leave your glory? This whole time, you should have been glorying in the in the Lord. First Corinthians one thirty one talks about if you're going to glory, glory in the Lord. And he says in verse four, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He says, without me. They shall bow down under the prisoners. Without me, without the Lord, you can do nothing. John 15, 5, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Romans 5, 6 says, For we were yet without strength. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were without strength. Without Him, we can do nothing. Keep that in mind. Without Him, you're nothing. And He says, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners. That's pretty bad. You get under the prisoners. He says, without me, they shall fall under the slain. That's pretty bad. You're under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away. God gets angry. God is angry with the wicked every day. But his hand is stretched out still. He's still got his hand stretched out wanting you to come back. So, yet in a little while, just a little while, there's going to be a prescription for peace. And yet in a little while, the punishment's going to be passed. God's angry with the wicked. God's angry with the nation of Israel. But yet in a little while, the punishment's going to be passed. When the Lord visits your sins, the punishment doesn't last forever. And as a born-again believer today, you don't pay for your sins in eternity. You'll pay for them here. Whatsoever man soweth that shall, shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But just a little while, the punishment's going to be over. Now, back here, what we're dealing with in Isaiah, historically, Assyria is the one coming to leave them desolate. But it doesn't last forever, the thing they go through. Prophetically, there's a day the Lord is coming from far. Revelation 19, 14, the armies in heaven following them on white horses coming from the third heaven. They're coming from far to execute judgment. And there will be nowhere to go for help. But the punishment will pass. Israel has been punished ever since they were taken captive. They're going to be punished in Jacob's trouble. But yet in a little while, the punishment will be passed. In a little while, whatever sin you're paying for right now, it's going to be past. You, if you're saved, you're going to go up in the rapture. You're eventually going to die. If the rapture doesn't happen, the punishment's going to be past. And to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. You might be reaping some sins in the flesh right now, but soon the punishment will be over. Just a little while. Just keep going. Don't fret too much. In a little while, there's going to be a prescription for peace. The Lord's going to reign. The punishment's going to be passed. And he said, without me, you see, the punishment would be a hopeless feeling if you were without the Lord Jesus Christ. Without me, you can do nothing, he said. Without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He's an outstretched hand, just like he's stretched out his hand and Simon Peter said Lord save me and he grabbed hold of his hand he's an outstretched hand and it says in verse 5 O Assyrian the rod of mine anger 
and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. So the Assyrian. God uses Gentile kings like the king of Assyria as a rod to chasten Israel. He's just using the king of Assyria as a rod, as a stick to chasten his people with, to whip his people. The Assyrian pictures the Antichrist and the devil himself. He is likened with Nebuchadnezzar over in Jer <coughs> Sorry. Jeremiah fifty seventeen. It says, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of, As of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. So God is using the king of Assyria to devour the northern kingdom. And then he uses Nebuchadnezzar to devour the southern kingdom. And we know Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the Antichrist. The Assyrian is a picture of the Antichrist. And the Assyrian is a rod that God uses to whip a hypocritical nation. As it calls him. It says, And I will send, in Isaiah 10, 6, I will send him against an hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread down like the mire of the streets. So, O Assyrian, he's just the rod of the Lord's anger. Just a puppet. Just a plaything in God's hand. He's the staff of, and the staff in their hand is the Lord's indignation. The thing that Assyria beats Israel with is just the staff of the Lord's indignation. And he sends them. He, he stirs up adversaries against them when they go against him. Just like with Solomon. God stirred up an adversary against Solomon when he got off into sin. Many times in your life, you'll get off into sin and God will raise up an adversary against you. Some thorn in the flesh may be at your workplace to just bug you to death every day and cause you trouble as a judgment. He says, I will send him against a hypocritical nation, that's Israel, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge. He See, he's given the king of Assyria a charge. The king of Assyria is, is just a mortal man. He's nothing. God's given him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey. You know, take everything they got. Go in there. Kill them. Take the spoil. Take the prey. Tread them down like the mire of the streets. Just stomp them all over the streets. The Assyrian. The rod of his anger. So he's given a charge by the king of kings. The Assyrian thinks he's the king of kings, but he's given a charge by the king of kings. The Assyrian is just the instrument or the tool that God is using to punish Israel with. Wicked men have no idea that they're being used by God. You see in verse 7, it says, How be it he meaneth not so. Talking about the Assyrian. How be it he meaneth not so. Neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to do to destroy and cut off not a few. He has no idea that the Lord has put this in his heart. He thinks he's doing everything on his own. He thinks that he's some big dog, got all this power, all these people, all these weapons. But in Proverbs 21, 1, it says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. You think about the world rulers. None of the stuff they're doing is by chance. God puts things in their heart. Now, he, they have a free will, but God's got it set up to what, where whatever they choose to do Whatever decision they make, it's always going to turn out just like the Bible said it would, just like the Lord wants it to. 
He gives them a choice. He gave Pharaoh a choice. Pharaoh hardened his heart back there before the Lord ever hardened his heart. The Assyrian came to a crossroads and made a choice, hardened his heart before God ever did anything to his heart. God didn't just automatically make him evil. He chose to be evil. But God used his evilness. God didn't want Lucifer to rebel, but God used his rebellion. It says, Howbeit he meaneth not so. You ever heard somebody, some wicked person say, I, I really didn't mean it. I didn't mean for this to happen. And it's almost like they're a little remorseful. Uh, many men claim remorse. And I didn't mean it. But really, most times they did mean it. Just running over people. Doing people wrong. They could care less about anybody else, only about themselves. And then they'll say, I really didn't mean it. Neither doth his heart think so. Well, you don't know how evil you can become. It reminds me of that story over in Second Kings 18. Second Kings 18, 13 through 15, where it says, Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fit cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah sent to the king of Assyria to, to Lachish. Wait, I'm giving you the wrong verse here. Let me find it. It's Second Kings eight thirteen. It says, And Haziel said, What is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? Well look at Second Kings eight twelve. And Haziel said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire. And their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. So Elijah's telling this guy, you're going to kill these children, you're going to rip up the women with child. And Haziel said, but what, is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? Saying, you know, Haziel talking by himself, am you thinking I'm going to do such a horrible thing? And Elijah answered, The Lord has showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elijah and came to his master, who said to him, What said Elijah to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazael reigned in his stead. Hazael ended up doing those wicked things. He didn't know that he had it in him. He didn't know that he had it in him to do such a wicked thing, but he ended up doing it. You don't know that you have it in you, but in your flesh dwells no good thing. You are a wretch. And until you get delivered from the body of this death, you're capable of doing anything. If you get off into sin, you get away from the Lord, you may be the one that ends up saying, you mean not so. Neither did your heart think so. But it is in your heart to destroy and to cut people off, not a few. The heart's desperate, desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God only knows how wicked your heart is. You don't know how wicked you are. Your flesh is capable of doing anything. And it's in the Assyrian's heart to cut off many nations. In verse 8, it says, For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? He thinks he's the king of kings. He thinks he's some great one. 
And that brings to the next point. Yet a little while, pride's going to be put to an end. Lord, The Lord's going to show up. There's going to be a prescription for peace. There's, the punishment's going to be passed. And pride's going to be put to an end. This king of Assyria, he's led by the children of uh, the king over all the children of pride. The devil himself, Leviathan. You're going to see now how he's very connected with the devil. He thinks he can take down any city by his own power. He says, Is not Kalno as Carchemish? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? He's saying, you know, if I took down this city, I can take down that city. If I took down Kalno or Carchemish, I can take down Hamath. And our pad. And he says, As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. He thinks he can take down any sea by his own power. <coughs> and keep in mind the Assyrian can refer to any Assyrian king that God uses. God used the Assyrian kings as rods and even use the devil himself as a rod and the first devilish king that founded idols you see it says here it says he said as my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols found like founded <coughs> now Sennacherib king of Assyria here he didn't he hadn't found as in founded the kingdoms of the idols he's not old enough to do that but we know who did and notice this is isaiah 10 10 I link this with genesis 10 and verse 10 it says well look at verse 9 first genesis 10 9 or look at 8 genesis 10 8 and cush begat nimrod he began to be a mighty one in the earth he was a mighty hunter before the lord Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalni, in the land of Shinar. So you see, Nimrod, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. That's where idolatry shows up. And it says in Genesis 10, 11, out of that land went forth Asher, A-S-S-H-U-R, and built it Nineveh. You see, Asher, Assyria. And it says over in Isaiah 10, 10, As my hand hath founded, hath found the kingdoms of the idols. The Assyrian, it's like the Lord sees all these kings as, a, as the same because they're all led by the same spirit. It's kind of like Pharaoh. There's more than one Pharaoh. But they're all led by the same spirit. And one of the pharaohs was a, a, a Syrian. You see, he's seeing all these wicked kings as the same because they're led by the same spirit. And he refer, refers to them like they did the set, one of them did something in the past. It says, As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols. Sennacherib didn't, but Nimrod did. And it says, Whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. So you, now look how now look how prideful he is. Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Now see, Jerusalem under Hezekiah, they clean up before the king of Assyria gets there. In Second Kings nineteen fourteen through nineteen, Hezekiah gets things cleaned up, and God spares them. And then in verse twelve, it says, "Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed His whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart." of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. 
You see, when God's done using the king of Assyria as the rod and the whip to beat his people with and punish them, he's going to punish Assyria for doing it. He says, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. And he ends up getting murdered by his two sons in 2 Kings 19.35-37, the king of Assyria does. The fruit, the, or the first devilish king that founded idols is back in Genesis 10.10, 10, Gentile number. Idolatry begins with Babel. You see that same wickedness flow throughout the Bible. Now we're in Isaiah 10.10. 10. You got Sennacherib, king of Assyria. He's going to punish Israel, and God's going to punish him for punishing Israel. Even though the Lord used him to punish Israel. It's funny how the Lord does things and works. And the Lord's going to punish him because he's so prideful. He's full of himself. He thinks that he's doing all this on his, on his own. And when the Lord is done performing his work, he's going to put an end to the stout heart. And notice that word stout. Once again, connecting Assyria, the king of Assyria, with the Antichrist. Because in Daniel 7.20, it talks about the Antichrist, and it says, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And king of Assyria, he gets murdered by his own two sons. But then you get into verse 13 and 14, and it really shows you just how prideful this man is. Verses 13 and 14. Look what he says. For he saith, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. And I have removed the bounds of the people and have robbed their treasures. And I have put down the inhabitants the inhabitants like a valiant man and my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people and as one gathereth eggs that are left and have I gathered all the earth and there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peak you see how many times he said I and my kind of like the devil in Isaiah 14 what did he say I will be like the most high I will ascend up above the stars. Just in Ezekiel twenty-eight seventeen, talking about Lucifer, the devil. In Ezekiel twenty-eight seventeen, it says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted by wisdom by the reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. You see, the devil was so lifted up Lifted up because of his beauty, lifted up because of his wisdom. The king of Assyria is very lifted up because of all the things that he has. And it should just remind you, just a little while, you're going to be put down if you're prideful. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Just a little while longer, the Lord's going to put an end to all these prideful, cocky people who think that they're better than everybody else. And the Lord's going to let this king of Assyria know that he's simply an instrument. He said, For he saith, By the strength of my hand have I done it. If it wasn't for God, he wouldn't even be able to open his hand. He says, And by my wisdom, if it wasn't for God, he, he would be a vegetable. He says, For I am prudent. I have removed the bounds of the people and have robbed their treasures. That's what the devil will do. He'll rob your treasures if you're a Christian. And I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. It, it's only by the grace of God that he can even walk. He says, And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. No, it's because God delivered them into your hand. He says, As one gathereth eggs that are left. So he's thinking, you know, he's going around to these nations and he's just grabbing the people and 
capturing them like they're Easter eggs or something. And he says, have I gathered all the earth? And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. You know, he thinks that nobody can stand against him. But now, let's let God speak for a minute. And God says, shall the axe boats boast itself against him that heweth therewith? You know, shall the axe brag and think he's better than the person that's using the axe? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? Can the saw start bragging and think he's more valuable than the person using the saw? As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, can the rod start talking and say, it's special when without the person using the rod, the rod can do nothing. Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. You see, the person in control of the axe and the saw and the staff is the one doing the work. Without the one doing the work, the axe and the saw and the rod are just going to lay on the ground. The one lifting up is the one doing the work. You see, the king of Assyria is just an axe and a saw and a rod and a staff. The Lord's the one doing the work. Without him, they can do nothing. If the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't laid down his life, they wouldn't have been able to crucify him. It says, Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. Now here's the next thing. The pride is going to come to an end just a little while. And in just a little while, the puffed up are going to be melted down. The Assyria, king of Assyria, he's all puffed up. But he's going to be, he was melted down. Nothing reminds you that you are but flesh like fire does. You start getting that flesh burnt, it reminds you really fast, you are but flesh. The Lord, the Lord of hosts, he's going to send among his fat ones leanness. So the fat ones, the, the nations, the, the best nations, he's going to turn them into leanness. There were fat ones, they're going to be skinny. He's going to mow them down. He's going to burn them up. They're going to be skinny. And he's going to kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And it says in verse 17, And the light of Israel. Who's the light of Israel? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. Then the light of Israel shall be for a fire. He's the light. Luke 2, 32. The light of Israel shall be for a fire. Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. And his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. You see? The second coming, it burns everything up. Second Thessalonians, what does it say? Second Thessalonians 1 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming is a day. And Malachi 4 1, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud. All the proud, the puffed up, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them, look at this, neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. See that? They're compared to roots, branches, trees, a forest that's going to be burned up, thorns and briars. Look at Ezekiel 20, 46 through 49. Ezekiel 20, 46. Son of man, set thy face toward the south, and drop thy word toward the south, and prophesy against the forest of the south field and say to the forest of the south hear the word of the lord thus saith the lord god behold i will kindle a fire there's that kindling a fire again i will kindle a fire in thee and it shall devour every green tree in thee and every dry tree the flaming flame shall not be quenched 
and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. Notice that all faces. So, so he's not just talking about trees. He's talking about people. All faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. And all flesh, flesh shall see that I the Lord have kindled it and it shall not be quenched. But look what the people say. Then said, Ah, Lord God, they say of me, doth he not speak parables? See that? They think he's just talking in parables. People, when you talk about how today, they think you're just talking about a parable or that Luke 16 is just a parable. But you see, a day's coming. The puffed up, just a little while, and the puffed up's going to be melted down. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he's coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance. Those thorns and briars get burned up. In Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, you see thorns and briars were refer to people when lord jesus christ comes he's going to consume everything like fire consuming a force men are like trees the blind man said in mark 8 24 i see men as trees walking then you go on a little bit further there in isaiah 10 18 it says and shall consume the glory of his forest our god is a consuming fire trees are like men and could shall consume the glory of his force and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. Showing you it's not just talking about trees, it's talking about people. And that ought to remind you of Matthew 10, 28. The Lord just can destroy both soul and body in hell. When he comes back at the second coming, he brings, he puts his own like a fire on the earth. And it's soul and body being destroyed at one time. You get, if in the millennium, the people that go against the Lord, there's a lake of fire on earth. They're going to have soul and body cast into hell. And then it says, and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth. The guy holding the flag or the, or the emblem, he's going to faint, showing their defeat. And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, so be few. That a child may write them. So few trees. So few people. That a little child. Could count them. You know my son. A little child. He can count a little bit. But not very far. He'll go. One, two, three, four, five, eight. Eleven, ten. But it's going to be so few left. That he could count them. And it shall come to pass. In that day. Note the phrase in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped to the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. It's going to come to pass in that day and that day's coming and just a little while the people of Israel are going to return. There's going to be a faithful remnant in that day. Second coming context. The remnant goes into the land. This is Israel that believes. Not wicked men of Israel, obviously. There's going to be a faithful remnant that will believe. At the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to trust in the Lord. They're not going to trust in the Antichrist. This is a faithful remnant. It says, the remnant shall return, in verse 21. Even the remnant of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Jacob got his name changed to Israel. The children of Israel come from Jacob, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people, Israel, be as the sand of the sea, Genesis twenty two seventeen, just like the Lord told Abram they would be, there's so many of them, just as a sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. Just a small remnant out of all that many people. And it says, the consumption decreed, that consumption God decreed, in Deuteronomy 28, 22, Leviticus 26, 16, shall overflow with righteousness. God's going to bring in righteousness. The people of Israel return. God's going to put his laws in their heart. They're not going to be under those unrighteous decrees anymore. We're going to live in righteousness. There's going to be a prescription for peace. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of all the land. Zephaniah 3.8, it says, it's his determination to gather the nations. Remember that? That way he can put an end to all those 
people making those unrighteous decrees. Put an end to all those people that don't want peace, but say peace, peace when there is no peace. And it says in verse 24, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. Just like in 1 Peter 3.14, Peter says, Be not afraid of their terror. Just like in Matthew 10.28, the Lord says, Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. You know, he, he says, He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee, after the manner of Egypt. You know, he's going to turn them into slaves. In the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be after the manner of Egypt. That's just like... That's what happened in Egypt. They they were made slaves. You look over there in Revelation 6, uh, 17, it talks about free man, and it talks about bond men. They're still going to have slavery in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to be using the Jews as slaves. And now here's our verse, verse 25, For yet a very little while, in just a little while, the indignation shall cease. And mine anger and their destruction. The anger will cease after the second coming. Just a little while. Just hang on a little while. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him, the Assyrian, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. Back there in Judges 7.25 is where you see that. You see those, those Old Testament stories you're reading like in Joshua and Judges and other places, those stories picture the second coming and how the second coming is going to be. Just like Gideon, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, what does Jesus Christ come back with at the second coming? A sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth. That pictures the second coming, that story of Gideon. According to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, and as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. Just like he killed Pharaoh, a type of the Antichrist. Back there in Exodus 14, you see him. Destroy him, Pharaoh. That's how he's going to destroy the Antichrist. And it shall come to pass in that day, second coming context again, when you see that phrase in that day, that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder, and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing, the Lord Jesus Christ returning King of kings, Lord of lords. That's when the yoke's going to be taken off. The antichrist is going to be gone. They're going to have that monkey off their back, off their shoulder. They're not going to have to worry about the antichrist anymore. They're not going to have to worry about these wicked Gentile kings anymore. He has come to Aeth. He has passed to Migran. Now, <clears throat> this is like showing the antichrist coming at him and making his way from the north to Jerusalem and this could also show you the path of the second advent and at the second advent you know what you're going to do you're going to pick out a horse so yet just a little while and you'll be picking out your horse Revelation 19 14 says the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses now me and you went out in a rat are going to go out in a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble we're not going through Jacob's trouble it's for Jacob not the church but we're going to come back with him on a white horse to defend Jerusalem with him. And it, it says, And he has come to Aeth, he has passed to Migran at Michmash, he hath laid up his carriages, they are gone over the passage, they have taken up their lodging at Geba, Ramah is afraid, Gibeah of Saul is fled. You know, the people flee from the Antichrist. Lift up that voice, O daughter of Galim, cause it to be heard in Delaish, O poor Anatoth. Anatoth, that's where Jeremiah was from, Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. Madmena is removed. The inhabitants of Givim gather themselves to flee. Mark 13.14, they flee. Let them which be into Judea flee. As yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. The Antichrist, he'll remain at Nob for a day and shake his hand against the Mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. And then look what happens. Verse 33. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lop the bow with terror. He's going to cut down the branches. He's going to cut down the tree. That's, he's going to lop it. 
cut it, and the high ones of stature, the giants shall be hewn down. He's going to mow them down, and the haughty shall be humbled. The puffed up will be melted down. The pride's going to come to an end. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. And who's that mighty one? You see it in Isaiah 11, 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the mighty one. And he's going to lop the bough. He's going to cut it off. The branch, the branches of those trees, the antichrist like a tree, the high ones of stature that's got the hot, hot like the cedars. He's cutting them off. That's what he does at the second coming. So, yet a little while, not much longer, Revelation 1-1 says it's going to shortly come to pass. Revelation 3-11 he says, Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 20, Even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus, yet a little while, you're going to be picking out your horse up there in heaven, coming back with the Lord on a white horse to defend Israel.